Christ our Lord be with you all. And also with you. As in the case during this stewardship season campaign, rather, today's sermon will have two parts to it. Part one would be from the gospel lesson that we read this morning. But part two, hopefully related, is also a, a comment and a, a comment on the on, on this on stewardship. And today we are in part three of the stewardship uh, drive, and the theme is giving is proportion to income. Giving is proportion to income. And let me read this uh, a passage that we have read a number of times, 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 16, 2, but specific emphasis on part 3. On the first day of the week, each of you is to set something aside and store it up as you may prosper. So that offering needs to be made when I come. You put something apart as you may prosper, so that offering needs to be made when I come. We'll put that aside for a moment and get back to the gospel text that we have read moments ago. And today's All Saints Day. We talked about it. I think you heard the sermon, and that's a big part of my sermon today, too. And sometimes when we talk about saint, we talk about people who are so special, who are so holy, that we all look up to. In the Roman Catholic Church, and we probably remember in recent years, two very important people were being uh, raised up to sainthood. One is Mother Teresa, and I think another one, I believe, is Pope John Paul II. Those indeed are saints that I personally, and I think the whole world, many of us, have great respect for. In Greek, the word saint is really the word holy. And the word holy is related to the Greek word which means separate. People who are separate from the crowd. People who, none of us, at least myself, are not part of, but people who kind of got set apart or, well, because of their own effort, being set apart from the rest of us. But the gospel lesson today tells us otherwise. Saint is not just somebody who set apart because of their accomplishment. Saints are all of us. And the gospel proof and the scriptural proof is here in the book of, of, the book of Matthew, chapter 5, the Beatitude. I want to focus more on verses from, on verses nine, uh, from verses 3 through 9. And if you look at that, these eight verses, these eight verses, a book ended by the second part of the verse that says, For theirs is the kingdom of God. So the kingdom of God is what bracket these eight, eight list, this list of eight types of saints, if you will. When I look at this list of eight types of saints, to me there are like three subgroups. The first four. The first word talks about people in their social psychological state. It's really not complimentary if you look at that. The, the list includes those who are poor in spirit, those who mourn, those who are meek, those who are hungry and hunger, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. I'll get back to that in a moment. And the second list, in the second set, has to do with those who try to do something in the relationship with other people. So that includes merciful, pure in heart, and peacemakers. I'm sure we can go on and on and on and talk about each of the eight, but I'm just going to talk about, for, for each of the, these two groups, kind of select one group to talk about in brief. I think the first four, poor in spirit, mourning, and meek, and hunger, and thirst for righteousness, could actually be summarized by the first group, that is poor in spirit, poor in spirit. Laura mentioned a moment ago those moments when we feel that we are at the end of the road. I think that's, that's what, what this, this phrase talked about. The word poor in spirit, now in Greek, the word, that word, the word that's, that, that is designated for poor is not just somebody who does not have money. That's the usual, that's the usual con uh, connotation, isn't it? We don't have money, we don't have resources, then we are poor. But the word poor, that word, that Greek word poor, is linked to the word falling or flying. Now, let 
sounds a little bit odd, right? Falling and flying are two different things. But if you look at that, it has, some, it has some similarities. It is a word that describes a state of, a state of being when we are in situations where we cannot stand, so we keep falling. Or in a situations where we cannot stand, we cannot hold on, anchoring onto anything, that the, when the wind blows, you get blown away. So it's a very descriptive phrase, talking about the times in our lives when our spirit, when our breathing, and when everything that we have left in us, is there anything left when we are, when we are alive, the, the breathing, when the, nothing else is gone? When that very thing that has left in us, breathing, pneuma in Greek, is so weak. It's so weak that we, kept fall, we keep falling and keep being blown away. When those kind of situations come to us, that is the time when we are blessed. Isn't that something? And then let's look at a second group. There's three things. Those who are merciful, pure in heart, and peacemakers. I want to highlight the word peacemakers. How many of you just love to be a peacemaker? Just love to walk into play time and places when people are borrowing? How many of you? Anybody want to raise your hand? <laughs> Alan? Well, 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 die. well, that's great. I mean, I'm glad to have some peacemakers. I have to say that when I hear people arguing, I want to go back to my room, turn on my, you know, uh, watch my uh, uh, computer or whatever, and I want to go away. Because peacemaking has to be one of the most difficult things to do in life. When people are arguing, people are not always rational. You know, it's all not always easy to sort out who is right and who is wrong. And it's not always easy to look through the kind of struggling in people's heart and soul and mind. It takes mercy, it takes the purity in heart to be good peacemaker. And also, there's another thing too, peacemakers do not always succeed, am I right? And then of course the last one, it says, those who are persecuted, those who are persecuted for the sake of righteousness, these, these folks, these eight groups, that can be categorized into three, who are not always successful, who do not possess the quality that we worship in life, that is confidence, resourceful, forceful even, and, and successful. Instead of those successful images, Jesus says, no, it's those who are poor in spirit, who are grieving, who are weak, who are hungry for justice, who are merciful, pure in heart, and who tries to be a peacemaker, who tries to do good things, and sometimes fail. It is this group that are blessed because they, in, in, basically, they, is it within them, there is God's kingdom. Think about how powerful this passage is. The power in the passage is Jesus is telling us if you are successful and doing good, God bless you, that's wonderful. But if you are in the margins, if you are failing, if you cannot breathe, and you found that all you have left, your breath, your breath is weak, it's not sustaining you, don't give up. Those are not the moments when God has forgotten you, but instead, those are the moments when God's grace and love is pouring on you, you are blessed in those very moments. Don't look at the success in the world. Reminds me of a kind of a corny story that I heard moments ago, some, about a year ago. It's still kind of corny, so I, I want to apologize. And I kind of modified to make it even cornier. Okay, so. <laughs> so that's a story of, of the Pearl Gate. We heard a lot of those stories, right? Of Pearly Gate, and people died and go to Pearly Gate, and then Peter and St. Peter and some of the other assistants would kind of judge on whether this person could indeed be, uh, be worthy of heaven. So there are three people standing in line to, they just die, go in to try to get, get to heaven. And then the one is a general, a national hero, you know, very proud and very forceful and kind of voice like this. And then the other one is a very successful church person and 
does a lot of great things and runs great organizations and, you know, pastor of a big church and all those kinds of things. And the last one is a homeless person. So, so St. Peter, uh, facing the three and, you know, lay out the rules and he said, well, you need to earn 100 points before you get to heaven. So, so the first one, the general walked walk in with his, you know, with, the, with, the, the, with, with, the, with his uh, uniform and looking really proud and all that stuff. And then, and then, you know, in front of St. Peter, he kind of began to lay out all his accomplishments for the country, for the world, and so on and so forth. And, and so he asked, well, St. Peter, how many points am I, do I have? St. Peter said, uh, it's about 10. What? Okay, of course, and he argued with St. Peter's and so on and so forth. Eventually, he got into heaven. I don't know how that works, but, <laughs> but he got into heaven. So the second one came through a, a very successful uh, a church uh, worker, a, a church leader, a pastor, evangelist, and, you know, running a wonderful organizations and, and do a lot of good charity work and so on and so forth. And, and he came through the pearly gate and, and uh, he said, well, I, I try to be humble, but, <laughs> but, I, but I do accomplish a lot. You know, I do listen to Jesus, read the scriptures, so on and so forth, and you, you name it. And so how many points am I getting? So Peter, you know, huddling with his assistants and saying, uh, pretty good. 15 points. What? 15 points? I worked so hard. What are you talking about? So they argue and argue. Eventually, he got into heaven. Well, so comes the homeless person. He, he maybe she, uh, came in without anything. And she said, Peter, I, I didn't even know I died. I slept on the street last night. It was cold and somehow I'm here. Um, what am I supposed to do? Well, Peter gave him the rule and, well, you need to earn 100 points and all that stuff and he said, well, I, I don't have anything. I have not accomplished anything. You know, day in and day out, day in and day out on, on the streets, and I think about all the failures I have in my life. And some of my failures is understandable. Some of my failures I'm ashamed of. I don't have anything. Peter said, uh-huh. Say more, say more. And then he said, but you know what? Day, day, day in and day out, and, and I don't even have a place to stay. I don't have a Bible with me. But I do remember. I do remember a song that I, that I learned when I was in, 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 in Sunday school, which is, Jesus loves me. Yes, I do. And there are days and days and days. I'll be walking on the street, don't know where to go, don't know where to get my food and shelters and whatnot. I can do nothing, simply pray and pray that. Pray that somehow, somehow shelter would come, food would come, and I don't know how and what, but somehow in, in some moments when I'd never expected, shelter opens to me, food available for me. All I have is to be thankful, but yet still struggling for the next day. St. Peter and his assistant listened, listened with great attentiveness and said, Wow, my son, you have earned 1,000 points. Come and enjoy the eternal feast. To me, that's the spirit of Bethany Fire. It's not that God encouraged us not to be successful, not to work hard. I'm not saying that. But the gospel of Jesus is different from the gospel of the world. We are not, uh, we are not being rec necessarily recognized by what we achieve, although this is important. But we are recognized when we are connected with God in a special way. And also, we are recognized, when we recognize God's grace comes into our life. Again, Laura, thank you for the testimony, the story about hearing, getting a package, of, of, of finding the words of consolation in the midst of our struggle. That to me, that to me is the essence of, of the gospel. So with that in mind, how do we give back what we have? How do we look at the grace that we have received when we are not worthy of anything? How can we be intentional and in looking at the proportion of what we have and give whatever we have? Several years ago, like, well, not too long ago, I heard that the average of giving uh, in ELC is about 3%. This is not about right, Bill. We're thankful for that. I'm not going to try to lay guilt trip or anything. We thank God for But at the same time, if we look at what the gospel of Jesus Christ is all about, it's about grace. 
It's about us. It's about God's love into the most marginalized in the world. God's grace in our own life when we are in a state of being marginalized. And how God's grace comes to us in ways that we can never fully understand. Then the question that we should ask ourselves is, how can we, how can we support the ministry, not just St. Barnabas, support the wider ministry of Jesus Christ, so that that grace, that grace could, could be felt and be embraced by more. I think a couple weeks ago, I think, Bill, you talked about, you know, the challenge from St. Barnabas is, it doesn't matter where you are in terms of the proportion of whatever you have. But let's challenge ourselves. Let's challenge ourselves. If, if, you are, if you think that you can only give this, just add a dollar a week, a dollar every other week, even a dollar a month, 50 cents, it doesn't matter. What matters is a recognition of the strength, the importance of God's grace in our lives. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are those who are poor in spirit. For theirs is the kingdom of God. That has been a message. That has been the essence of my own journey, particularly in the last few weeks, when I don't find a lot of strength in myself to embrace much of anything. May God's grace come to all of us. May God's grace lead us through into God's new journey for all of us in the future to come. Amen.